Hello everybody, Steve the Amateur Historian here. How y'all doing tonight? I've recently been doing a lot more delving in, trying to find more mysterious, unsolved kind of content to produce for my Mystery Murder series. So there's probably going to be a lot more episodes in that series. Uh, coming along, I still have some sitting on my channel that haven't been posted yet. So settle in because that is going to be probably a continuous ongoing series on my channel, like some other things. Coming to you from my simple setup in my simple little apartment. I didn't even take the time to move this blanket out of the way and shove this pillow a little bit over here because what you see is what you get. In a series where I'm talking about people whose you know lives were taken in horrendous ways or even people that just vanished forever and likely had their lives end in horrendous ways, there are certain things that are a little bit more important than having a perfect backdrop around you and I ain't got the money for anything that flashy anyway. I'm still salty about some guy that came on my channel for one of the videos in this series a while back. I covered a story about a teenage girl who was murdered, had her head cut off, and a guy had the nerve to come onto my channel and leave this chapter out of a book, essentially, comment talking about how my backdrop isn't cool enough and that if I really want to hang in there with the other true crime video makers, I would spice it up a bit. And I'm like, time and place, man. Beyond that, I'm not a true crime channel. I'm a history channel that has a lot of true crime content. So anyway, now I'm just salty about my background. But anyway, uh, today's story is of the type that I always get really interested and invested in. And these are stories that in their time got a lot of attention, but in the prevailing years, perhaps decades since, they've generally just loomed as forgotten. And when I tried to look up information about this case, just, you know, general online searches, I couldn't find anything outside of a collection of newspaper articles from primarily the late 20s and then the late 40s, 20 years after those events happened. So this is a, a case that is very lost to history and yet a very intriguing story where the simple solution that authorities were chasing for many, many years may have actually been uh, just a wild goose chase that they were on. Then again, they may have been chasing the right man all along. Today's mystery murder story is about the 1927 murder of Klamath Falls, Oregon resident and gun shop employee, a man named Johnny Ansel. Now I assume I'm pronouncing his last name right. His last name was spelled N-N-A-N-S-E-L. So I think Ansel. It's Hansel without the H is kind of how I think about it. Johnny Ansel had been working for a particular gun store in Klamath Falls on Main Street, right on the main drag. In fact, I think it was just, it had a very simple generic name. It was called like The Gun Store or The Gun Shop. I first discovered it by reading an article about kind of the mystique of the place and how they had a big like rifle over the store sign. And so, so it had, it was, it was one of those things where if you're driving down the main drag, you see all these stores and they all kind of look the same. And then you see that and it kind of catches your attention. Now, Johnny Ansel, by 1927, the end of 1927, he'd been working in this store for nearly two decades. I heard reports both that he'd worked there for 17 years and 18 years. So, somewhere in that mix. And this gun shop was owned and operated by a gun aficionado, as you would assume, named Barney Chambers, and him and Johnny Ansel were apparently really, really good friends. Uh, probably part of the reason why Johnny Ansel worked there so long. And 
Uh, Johnny was a very well respected and liked guy in town. It's always those ones. And it's New Year's Eve, December 31st, 1927. Johnny shows up at the store like any other day. He apparently was known for being a very punctual guy. If he was opening up the shop, he was always there right on time. In this case, 6.30 a.m. He was there, had the store opened up, and ready to go. And presumably, as I understand it, he was there alone. There, were, there was nobody else working there with him during these morning hours. Now, he opens the shop at about 6.30. Sometime, probably around 7 o'clock, there's a guy by the name of Jerry Bellamy who's also there. He worked in the gun shop as a janitor, and reportedly he worked as a janitor in multiple businesses all around Klamath Falls. He just kind of, wherever somebody needed janitorial work done, Jerry was there. So Jerry states that he's there, you know, like most janitors, he's probably working through part of the night. And he says he sees Johnny when he comes in and around 7.15, Jerry goes to leave. He's done with his work for the day. And he states that as he leaves, Johnny is there and there's one other man there, a man he doesn't recognize, doesn't know, and he's wearing a slouched hat and a short kind of fur-like woolen coat. This is the only other gentleman in the store. 7.15, Jerry leaves. 10 minutes later, 7.25 p.m., another guy from town walks into the gun, sh gun shop and doesn't see anybody there. He goes towards the back room, and there in that room, next to the safe, holding all of the money, and silver, reportedly, that the gun shop kept, there was Johnny Ansel, lying dead on the ground, gunshot wound to the head. The bullet had passed right through his head and had struck an icebox behind him. So it's pretty obvious, it seems, somebody came there with the specific objective to kill Jerry Ansel. They shot him right in the head. And there was a decent amount of cash and silver in that safe that the individual responsible for this could have taken, but they left it there. They, as it seems, shot Johnny and walked right out of the store. And it was in this 10 minute period between when Jerry Bellamy, the janitor, leaves and this next individual goes in who discovers Johnny dead. So the presumption is this other gentleman that was in the gun shop that Jerry saw when he left was likely the person responsible. Could have been another customer that the real guilty party was waiting to leave. You know, they could have been standing there watching the store and waiting for a moment where Johnny was there all by himself. Whatever the case, a man matching the general description of this individual that Jerry saw was later seen getting into a 1927 Chrysler at a garage close to the gun shop and driving away. Police were quick to uh, try to track down any Chryslers that they found, and they had only a very general description of this individual that was seen in the shop. So the police already have their, their work cut out for them. And again, Jerry Ansel is a very respected guy around town. So like in a lot of cases, nobody could think of any reason why someone would just walk into his place of business and shoot him dead. He's been working in this store in the middle of town for nearly 20 years and everybody likes him. And it's Klamath Falls. You know, it's, it's a decent sized community, but it ain't a big city. It's not like there was a whole bunch of people that wouldn't know this guy and would just for some reason have a need to go into a gun shop and kill a guy. So it has all of the makings of a very frustrating case. 
something where this guy could have gotten into his Chrysler and driven off just about anywhere. I mean, Klamath Falls is surrounded by a very rural landscape. You got to drive a pretty good distance before you find the next decent sized city. It's, you know, it's just open Southern Oregon. Now, there is one break in the matter. Uh, there, there's an, there's an initial, uh, Jerry Bellamy is initially arrested because he was there. He admits to being there pretty close to when uh, Johnny was killed. So he was briefly arrested and held as a possible suspect, but they determined pretty quickly that he wasn't responsible and he was released shortly after. Now, I don't know if he had any proof that he was somewhere else after 7.15. It doesn't, I, I, I never read anything that provided definitive proof that he couldn't have been responsible. Now, it doesn't seem like he would have a motive. Um, you know, he worked at a janitor at this place for a while, and Johnny frequently opened there, and there was, there was no reason to believe that these guys didn't get along with each other. But still, just for the sake of contemplation, I didn't find anything that definitively stated this guy couldn't have been responsible for the murder. So Jerry, the janitor, was briefly held and then let go, and the police are back at square one searching for s suspects. Now, one of the intriguing elements of this case, and it's probably one of the few things that helped authorities narrow down uh, their, you know, the possible suspects is the type of ammunition that was used, it was described specifically in newspapers as soft no, um, a soft-nosed round from a 3840 Winchester pistol. Now, that information got back to Barney Chambers, the guy who owned the store, who, again, knows guns and knows ammunition very well. And he knew right away that this was a very rare weapon. And he, um, you know, on behalf of you know, doing some work for authorities to try to help them, he looked through all of uh, the records that he had for who owned a weapon of this type in Klamath County, the whole surrounding area. And he only found three different um individuals in the area that owned this type of weapon and that helped authorities narrow down who they thought was responsible now this being said whoever was responsible could have been somebody who didn't live in Klamath County and could have gotten a Winchester pistol from somewhere else or they could have purchased a Winchester pistol in another county or another state wherever and then been in the vicinity of Klamath Falls at that time. So this this was not uh, definitive science by any stretch of the imagination, but authorities are desperate. They need to get moving on this case, and they, they have nothing. They have the janitor for like a day, and they're back to square one, and you've got this guy who's a pretty beloved guy. So the locals want something done about this. So Barney Chambers gives the authorities the push they need. They've narrowed it down to three individuals. However, ultimate focus is only put on one of these individuals. And that was a guy by the name of John Meek. John Meek reportedly owned this exact type of weapon. I found no information about background details on the other two people in the county that owned that type of weapon, or if they were ever investigated, looked into. I, I didn't find any information on that. Again, I'm relying almost exclusively on a collection of old newspaper articles that all stipulated, even many, many, many years later, that this was an unsolved case. Now, Meek lived uh, in the vicinity of Odessa, Oregon, which is, you've got Klamath Falls kind of or, uh, near the base of Klamath Lake, this massive lake. Odessa is more towards the northern side of the lake, um, the northwest and very small community. It's almost, it's pretty much one highway um, 
and almost pretty much all the roads in town, even to this day, are like gravel. It's very rural. And Meek had a homestead there, specifically on a Rocky Point Road, which, like I just said, even to this day is a gravel uh, road. Kind of just takes you off into the trees. So if that's how it is now... This is where this guy's homestead was in 1927, 1928. We're talking 93, 94 years ago. So very rural. Um, and he was simply described as a logger. He may have been involved in other kinds of work. I don't know. And I didn't really find a whole lot that suggests this guy was a violent criminal. But essentially within... Uh, it wasn't even 48 hours before the attention of John Meek came to authorities and they contacted him. They, they were just like, hey, hey, you just, you know, we have found this kind of weapon was involved in this case and you have one of these weapons. So let's just talk it over and see, you know, we just want to make sure we're covering our bases. Try to, you know, be kind of sleek and make this guy think that they're not really that suspicious of him. They just have to cover their bases when really they're probably prepared to arrest him the moment they come in contact. And while Odessa isn't too horribly far from Klamath Falls, it's the middle of winter. It's the, you know, the rural middle of nowhere. There's really heavy snowfall and it's just a really rough winter. And Meek is like, hey, no, I'm absolutely fine to come and talk to you. I just need to, I need, like, the snow to go, I need it, the weather to, um, I guess, warm up a little bit so that it's safe for me to drive down into town, into Klamath Falls. So he's fully in agreement to come and meet law enforcement and, you know, clear his name, presumably. Now, this is January 2nd, 1928, that this conversation takes place. So, Authorities in Klamath Falls are waiting for the weather to get just a little bit nicer. Or there's at least some break where it gets a little warm and the snow melts a little bit. And uh, Meek can climb into his truck and put put putter down into Klamath Falls. Well, the following day, January 3rd, John Meek climbs into his truck and beelines it south, probably drives right past Klamath Falls and down into California. And he stops his truck in Redding, California, leaves his vehicle there, and seems to have just abandoned it there, just left his vehicle there and took off. And definitively, John Meek was never seen after that, at least by the authorities that were trying to pursue him. Now it's the 1920s, it's a lot easier to disappear than it would be nowadays. People can track you so easily. But Meek drove right past Klamath Falls, abandoned his truck, and just disappeared. And even in articles I read 20 years down the road, people were still wondering what happened to John Meek. And there were there were reported sightings of him. There was one particular one of interest uh, not too long after Meek had begun his disappearing act. There was an individual that was reported on in local papers. They never gave him a name, but there was this guy that apparently knew John Meek, knew, knew him by name, knew what he looked like, and this individual had traveled down for some reason. This whole thing just seems kind of bizarre to me, and I don't really know if I fully believe it, or at least if I believe all of the details. So there was reportedly this small abandoned mining town, like it was a ghost town by the 1920s, called Monumental, California. I tried looking it up on Google Maps and couldn't find it, which, I mean, makes sense. If this place was pretty much a ghost town, a hundred years ago, it probably doesn't even remotely exist anymore. So why this guy would randomly, why he would personally know John Meek up in the Klamath Falls area and then just randomly be down in this part of California, 
seems a little suspicious. And anyway, he claims that he walks up to this shack that's still standing there. And he looks through the window and he sees this guy. And he recognizes him as John Meek. And he's sitting in there and he's oiling up a revolver. And the guy, like, see, and he, he knows, he's heard, you know, through the grapevine that people are looking for John Meek. So he splits and he goes to um, Crescent City on the California coast. So at least we can kind of guess that Monumental California was located somewhere near Crescent Valley because that was the next closest town that this guy went to. And he went to the authorities there and said, hey, I saw John Meek in this shack out there. And uh, by the time authorities get there, there's nobody there. If it was John Meek, he'd already split by then. And there's a somewhat comparable story to go along with that one. It's it's a little bit further on down the road. It's it's um, late spring or like late winter, early spring, 1931. So it's it's like you know three years later. John Meek hasn't been found by authorities. They're still hoping to find him someday. They'd actually put out a massive reward, try, like thousands of dollars. And this is the late 1920s. So this, this was a massive reward. They really wanted to find this guy. And everybody was pretty dead certain through all of this that John Meek was the guilty party in all of this. Why this guy would have an ax to grind with Johnny Ansel was anybody's guess you know obviously that long ago you know there's no social media these guys weren't going on twitter and roasting each other and one got you know pushed too far and got pissed and went and killed the other guy we don't know honestly what these guys what their personal um experiences with each other were we don't know if they were friends enemies casual acquaintances we have no idea but it's 1931, and there's a prospector, you know, prospecting uh, in the vicinity of Weaverville, California, or at least that, that was the closest town. I don't know exactly where Weaverville, California is. I'm assuming it's probably Northern California. And he's this guy, uh, Bill Ferguson, and he goes to authorities and tells him he's had a personal encounter with John Meek. And John Meek is out there in the wilderness with him. And John Meek's also working as a, as a, a prospector. He's down there panning for gold in the, you know, the rural California nowhere. And I don't know, maybe, you know, he shoots Johnny Ansel and has to go into hiding. And it's like, what are you going to do? You got to try to find money somewhere. Maybe I'll strike it rich and find some gold like these other guys have. And he actually says that, you know, when he encounters Meek, he asks him about the Johnny Ansel murder. Like, hey, hey, you know, between you and me, did you do that? And apparently John uh, Meek vehemently said he was innocent of that. He was absolutely not responsible. Was that honesty or was that guy just trying to save face in the presence of a guy that, you know, maybe this Bill Ferguson guy was going to go to the police and report on him, which is exactly what Bill Ferguson did. He went, um, eventually made it to the next town, which is probably Weaverville, and alerted authorities to this. And it's, it's another thing. John Meek, it seems he keeps getting saved by horrible weather. Um, apparently, you know, it's, it's rough rural California and it's winter time again and it takes a really long time before authorities can get out to the general area that Bill Ferguson says he encountered John Meek at and by that point nobody's out there so again another report on John Meek and it's 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 another thing that just didn't go anywhere and from that point on the periodic lead would come in here or there, but none of them ever resulted in anything. John Meek had just become a a legend at this point. Like, did he even exist? He just disappeared. And there was there was one other uh, possible lead in the uh, autumn of 1928. Again, it's several months after the murder. That I, th I think this was just the authorities kind of just chasing whatever they could. 
there was apparently this guy by the name of David McCoy, which authorities thought, well, maybe that's just John Meek using an alias. And he was uh, traveling through rural Idaho and apparently like menacing local homesteaders with a, with a gun and stuff like that. So locals and authorities were like chasing after this guy, trying to bust him because he, he was just a menace to anybody that he came upon. And, you know, uh, authorities thought, you know, maybe this is Meek, but honestly, even in newspapers, they pretty much said the only reason they felt like this guy might have been Meek uh, posing as someone else was because this guy was kind of traveling through uh, Idaho, but a rural stretch. And with his experience uh, living kind of in the rural shadow of Klamath Falls, that was one thing about John Meek was he knew how to get around in rural surroundings, which would work to his advantage if he was trying to escape, especially if he's fleeing off and trying to hide out in, you know, rural Northern California. And here's a guy that has to stay off the main drag. He has to, you know, survive off the land. He has to, you know, sleep on a bed of rocks if he has to. He's got to be able to, to you know, do all this. There's been so many cases um, over the passage of time. Some cases that I've covered where people commit a crime as bad as murder and they try to escape and they'll flee into the rural wherever and then like within a week they come stumbling back into town and they look like they're half dead like they just couldn't survive out there in the wilderness for more than a week they're starving they're cold they're sickly and they're so battered by those conditions that they were completely unprepared to survive in that some of them have literally come back into town and turned themselves in because they're just too exhausted to fight any longer and John Meek was the opposite of that, which is probably why he was able to disappear. Um, and a multitude of different things could have happened. He, um, you know, he was living a rough life. He could have, you know, obviously had an accident and died. You're, you're living out there in the rural nowhere with, you know, who knows out there. Maybe he was killed by some lunatic or maybe he did find some gold and another prospector stumbled onto him and killed him for his gold. I mean, it's probably a stretch, but it might have happened. He could have just eventually just continued to maneuver further and further and further away from the Pacific Northwest. And, you know, again, back then you could, if you got far enough away from your problems, a lot of times they wouldn't catch up with you. And it was real easy to establish a new identity, a fake identity. That, that kind of stuff was a lot easier to pull off. This guy could have changed his name, moved to the Midwest or whatever. And, you know, people in Oregon are sitting there wondering what the hell happened to this guy. And he's just living another life, you know, out there somewhere. So... By 1948, which those are the last articles I found on this, and I found nothing since then that suggests this murder has been solved or suggests that anybody's really even um, investigated it. It's such an old case that I feel like even nowadays they wouldn't even bother like investigating it as a cold case. I mean, there's really nothing to go on that wasn't already known about, you know, within the first week after the murder happened. So it's still, it still sits here as unsolved, but, you know, I've been sitting here rambling about John Meek for the past while, and it's like, well, okay, fine, maybe we don't have a witness that can specifically put John Meek there, you know, he, see, he, he owned a gun of that same type, and what also made him look guilty was the gun that he specifically owned was found thrown into some brush in Klamath Falls. So, if he's not guilty, why is he ditching this weapon that's the exact same model of gun that was used to kill Johnny Ansel? Why does he suddenly ditch it in some brush right after? Now, he could have thought, you know, for, for all we know, he could have thought, oh my god, like, they're gonna think I did this if he is innocent. And January 3rd, when he blows blows down the highway and blows right past Klamath Falls, maybe he gets desperate and, like, throws his gun away. I could see someone in, a, in, a, in an act of desperation doing that, especially if the police contact him, and that's the one thing they're focusing in on is, oh, well, you have this same make of gun. 
he's going to think, I got to get rid of this effing gun. And that might be something a desperate, innocent person would do because he definitely could have thought, oh, well, I'm going, they're, they're, oh, they're going to they're gonna take me down for this either way. Some of the newspaper articles I read further on down the road that discussed maybe John Meek didn't do it, discussed how the, the attitudes of that time and the hostility and, and the fact that you know, everybody thought this guy did it. And then when he disappeared, that gave them more reason to believe he did it. The attitude was whether, you know, innocent or guilty, John Meek probably would have been convicted of this murder just based on the ownership of the similar type of gun. But again, you know, I, I couldn't find any information about the other two people in the county that own that same type of weapon and what their backgrounds were like. And again, somebody with that type of gun who purchased it in another county, another state, and was not on Barney Chambers, his, you know, docket of people that own this type of firearm, you know, that person could have rolled into town and done the shooting, and it wouldn't have been John Meek. So I've been rambling about this guy for a long time, and it seems like, well, it's, it's, it's not really that much of a mystery, is it? Because everybody kind of thinks he still did it. Well... There's another possible twist to this overall story, and that is Barney Chambers, the guy that owned the gun store, and again, has presumably been longtime friends with Johnny Ansel. Why would he be involved? But as time went on, people started getting a little bit suspicious about him. And again, as I said earlier, Klamath Falls is a decent-sized town for where it's at, but it's still kind of a small town. And people talk. Rumors go around. You know, There's these kind of unspoken yet frequently spoken uh, things that get around, and it never quite gets to law enforcement, or it never uh, becomes a big enough thing to where there's actual evidence there, but it's more people saying, hey, you know... It's basic information. Everybody in town knows this is going on. And granted, those aren't, you know, the greatest things to rely on. It's just a lot of gossip and rumors. But that stuff kind of started going around about Barney Chambers. And people started wondering if maybe he actually knew a little bit more about this situation than he was leading on. I mean, this murder did happen in his establishment. And there were rumors going around that uh, Chambers had not been paying Johnny Ansel all he should have been paid for the work he was doing, and that he may have owed him like a couple thousand dollars in back pay, which back then, that's a considerable chunk of change, and people wonder, friendship or no, did Johnny Ansel get fed up of waiting to get paid what he was deserved? Could that have created some controversy? Could he have stumbled onto something about, you know, some secret Barney Chambers was keeping that he wasn't supposed to know. These Again, if these guys are friends, even then, maybe he learns something he's not supposed to know. Maybe Barney Chambers is crooked as hell. But again, these are, these are still lingering rumors. But it is important to note the whole reason John Meek became the focus of the investigation was Barney Chambers willingly of his own volition said hey police i'm gonna look through all these records and see who owns this type of gun that fired these type this bullet that killed johnny ansel and he's the one that tells authorities oh there's only a couple people in this county that did it he's also the one that says hey but i think out of all those i think john meek is probably responsible and it's it's not directly stated but it's kind of inferred that john meek was probably a customer at that gun store um there was kind of an inference that barney chambers probably knew john meek at least as a casual acquaintance which would mean johnny ansel would probably know him too so barney chambers is almost exclusively responsible for putting the focus of the investigation on john meek who again did disappear shortly after which makes him look guilty but again if if in that situation, he could have thought, I'm, I'm going to go down for this, whether I'm innocent or not. They're going to frame me for this. 
So that's enough to make an innocent person run too. When people run away, usually it's a sign of guilt. Sometimes it's the fear of being found guilty for something you didn't do. That happens too. So I don't think the fact that John Meek ran away, presumably, is definitive proof of his guilt by any stretch of the imagination. That's, that's what got people talking, is Barney Chambers. He was a very significant figure in this, and he ran this very popular local gun store that people from all over Southern Oregon, I mean, people would come in from the mountains 100 miles away just to go to his gun store. This was a, a very popular place, and Barney Chambers was a pretty significant individual in town. I'm not saying he necessarily had great influence or anything like that, but I get the feeling that he pointed the police in this direction, and they were more than willing to believe what he was telling them without really doing a whole lot more digging into that matter on their own. And maybe that's why we have no information about these other two people in the county that had this same type of gun. Whether those gun people were tracked down, whether their guns were checked, whether they were tested. It's not even stated because they say they found John Meek's gun, but I found no information that showed that they, you know, test fired it, that they checked how many rounds were still in it. Was there only one round missing? Anything that would tie it closer into the case. But possibly... Beyond all that, one of the most intriguing factors that definitely makes people wonder, was Barney Chambers more connected in this thing than, than we were led to believe? Uh, was he there? Could he have been responsible? Could he have hired somebody to take out um, Johnny Ansel? Because of some, again, things I discussed earlier, perhaps a disagreement, issues over getting paid. Maybe Johnny Ansel learned something about Barney that he wasn't supposed to know. You know, it seems whoever went there, again, went there with the objective of killing Johnny Ansel. Because they just walked in there, shot him, didn't steal anything, and walked out. I mean, it seemed pretty clear this was a direct focused effort on that one individual. So whoever was responsible would have to know that Johnny Ansel was going to be there at that time, that he was going to be opening that day, that he would be at that shop at that time. And they would have to, you know, they might have to know other details, like how busy is the place at this given time? If it's a place that's pretty busy in the morning, maybe you don't go in and shoot him at that time and get seen by a bunch of people. But, you know, all that contemplation aside, there's another pretty significant hitch to this case in regards to Barney Chambers. And that particular hitch is that on November 25th, 1937, Thanksgiving Day, and just a few weeks shy of it having been 10 years since... Johnny Ansel was killed. Barney Chambers, popular gun store owner, popular, you know, seemingly for the most part, well liked in town, put a revolver to his head and killed himself. And nobody was really certain why he would kill himself. It doesn't seem like he was dying of a disease. It doesn't seem like he was suffering from some horrible depression. I, I don't think he was under the serious influence of drugs or alcohol that might, you know, make him have a, a little bit of a break with reality. You know, there, there could have been some deep motive that led him to do it at that time that had nothing to do with his gun store, Johnny Ansel, any of that. But people did wonder, you know, why did this guy do this? He was a, you know, he was still a pretty well-liked guy with a successful business. In fact, the, the gun store continued to be a success long after he died. Like, it was still a thriving business by that time. So people wonder. Can't say for certain. But did Barney Chambers commit suicide? Possibly due to guilt 
over what he knew or his possible direct involvement in the murder of this close friend of his. That, you know, by all accounts, he wasn't killed. Johnny Ansel wasn't killed for some wrongdoing. It doesn't seem like this guy was killed by someone for sleeping with that guy's wife or, you know, he robbed a bank or he was just a general terror around town and someone finally decided to stand up to him. This guy, by all accounts, was a very well-liked and respected guy. And, you know, sometimes if you have a motive, a reason to kill someone like that, it'll eat at you over the years, even if you felt justified at the time. So people wonder, was John Meek... Um, more of a misdirection. Did investigators waste a lot of time and energy chasing a guy who was actually innocent? John Meek still could have been responsible. But maybe it was somebody else. Maybe it was Barney Chambers himself. But if he was responsible, I would almost more think he would get somebody else to do it for him. Especially if it's going to happen in his store. So, there's... More than one theory about what may have happened in this case. And unfortunately, by the end of the 1940s, that's really where most of the information pretty much goes dry. It didn't really get discussed much more in the future. You know, it'll, it'll pop up from time to time. Oh, one of, you know, Oregon's oldest unsolved murders, the 1927 case of Johnny Ansel. Who shot him in the gun store? We still don't know. We haven't learned anything new in the last 50 years. But, hey, we're going to talk about the case again. You know, those little one to two minute news snippets you see on TV from time to time. Who murdered this person? And people see it and go, oh, wow. And then everyone forgets again. Or, you know, it'll get the little corner piece. 60 years later, still unsolved. 10 years on down the road. It's been 70 years and we still don't know who killed Johnny Ansel. That's, um... Unfortunately, what happens with a lot of these cases is they just become less and less significant and people kind of feel like they're doing their due diligence by kind of just briefly referencing it, you know, whenever an anniversary comes around or something like that. But yeah, um, there was definitely renewed interest in the case 20 years down the road. But after that, this case kind of faded away. And again, even doing you know, basic online searches to see if anybody had written anything about this case. Any historians have covered this, uncovered more stuff than what I found in these newspaper articles. And I didn't find anything outside of these newspaper articles. I didn't find anything at all online about the murder of Johnny Ansel. So in so many ways, it is a very forgotten case. I mean, those are the most forgotten ones, are the ones where you can't even find some random history blog entry somewhere, something. There's just, there's nothing out there. When I would try to look up, you know, Johnny Ansel, 1927, Johnny Ansel, murder, Johnny Ansel, Oregon, there would be like less than 10 results that will pop up and none of them were related to the case. So again, those are the cases that get my attention. The most are the ones that are the most forgotten, and yet there's still these very intriguing and lingering mysteries that you hope will get solved, but I mean, in comparison to the other cases I've covered in this series, this being one of the oldest I've covered, I have little uh, faith that we will know the absolute truth about who killed Johnny Ansel unless there is some written confession covered in dust in some cabin that's just been sitting there for 30, 40, 50, 60 years or even more or something significant like that, which the odds against that are pretty strong. Without something like that, we'll, we'll never know. We're just left with a couple of names. Did John Meek do it? Did the janitor do it? Did Barney Chambers do it? Did he kill off his friend? Did he have his close friend, co-worker, killed off in his own place of business? We're probably never going to know. But even in that vein, stories like this really intrigue me. And I hope they do for you as well. And I still have to at least hope, very much against the odds, that someday this case will be solved. 
but I very highly doubt it. And that is, as far as I've been able to uncover, the 1927 mystery murder of gun store employee and Klamath Falls resident Johnny Ansel, a guy who by all accounts was a pretty chill guy, someone that was really well respected. And while nobody deserves to die in such a way, when you're a nice guy like that, he just really didn't deserve that ending. So all that said, thank you so much for stopping by, taking in this new installment in this series. I really appreciate those of you that are, have watched my content and continue to support my channel. If you're new here, hey, how you doing? Stick around. I have hundreds of videos on my channel and like more than 20 just in this series alone. And um, again, if you haven't done it yet or you're new to the channel and you want to help me out, give the video a like. That always helps. Uh, you want to subscribe to my channel. I'd love that too. I also have a Patreon page if you want to help me out in that way. The link to that is in the description along with links to various other forms of social media, my Facebook, my Instagram, uh, my Reddit, subreddit, all that good stuff. And all that said, thanks again one more time for stopping by. I appreciate it. And this has been Steve, the Amateur Historian.